the presentation of anarchism, anarchism. a social philosophy which aims at the emancipation, economic, social, political, and spiritual of the human race. The emancipation. Anarchist Essays is brought to you by Loughborough University's Anarchism Research Group. For more information on the ARG, see the link in the show notes or follow us on Twitter at ARGLBORO. Food Fight Subsistence and Stable Heterarchies in Vanuatu by James Flexner, recording this from the unceded territory of the Gadigal Wangal peoples of the Eora Nation, also known as Sydney, Australia. Over 5,000 years ago, people in the highlands of what is today called the island of New Guinea began a remarkable experiment. They began constructing massive garden systems with canals and raised beds. Selecting among the plants from their environment, they began cultivating the ancestors of today's yams, taro, and bananas, among other economically useful plants. Domesticated plants were eventually supplemented with pigs and chickens, probably introduced to New Guinea by sailors from Southeast Asia. One of the most important sites that preserves this story is a place called Cook Swamp. That's K-U-K for those wanting to look up more information, which has been excavated and studied by my colleagues Jack Golson and Tim Denham since the 1970s. Everything from stratigraphic evidence, the layers in the ground that allow us to reconstruct the history of a place, to microscopic pollen and phytoliths, the fossil silicate remains of plant cells, tells a story of intensive and independent creativity in developing a unique form of agriculture. So what does a 5,000 year old story about domestication have to do with our understanding of anarchy? To understand this, we need to follow one of the most deeply embedded myths in Western civilization discourse. It goes like this. Domestication of crops naturally results in a series of stages, as people settle by their gardens, settlements become towns, towns become cities, which become city-states and eventually empires. Even in the Mesopotamian region and other parts of the world where this trajectory was supposedly followed, the narrative is insufficient for understanding this deep past. Radically alternative trajectories, such as those in the region of island Melanesia, give us powerful tools to challenge the apparent naturalness of our own societies. Despite the early appearance of agriculture in New Guinea and its expansion into Oceania with Lapita people, more on that later, what was meant to follow, urbanism, kingdoms, territorial conquest and expansion, never arrived. This is not because of any deficit on the part of the people who settled in the region known today as island Melanesia or anything lacking in their environment. Rather, it represents a remarkable human achievement inventing mechanisms to maintain a relatively horizontal organization and to resist the pulls towards centralization that so many societies drift towards. As it turns out, the domesticated plants and animals that originated at Cook and places like it would end up essential to the maintenance of Melanesia's diverse forms of social order. This achievement is made even more remarkable considering Melanesian societies continue to persist and adapt over 400 years of European colonialism in the region. This includes the continuing intrusion of the capitalist world system with its endless capacity to turn people, plants and animals, land and sea into resources to be consumed for the benefit of people overseas. The language of progress and stages is so deeply embedded in Western discourse that it is difficult to find an adequate language to describe Melanesian histories. Too many terms suggest lack or inability. But we could say that if Western civilizations have given us hierarchies, cities, and empires, Melanesian civilizations invented horizontality and built self-sustaining island worlds. These islands, with their intensive systems of rotating agriculture, marine management systems, and exchange networks, are populated not only by millions of people, but a plethora of spirits and magical forces and beings that are integral to the functioning of those systems. Melanesians refer to the synthesis of their traditions, practices, and beliefs simply as custom or custom. <laughs> 
a term I will return to in describing the islands of southern Vanuatu, where I have done fieldwork for over a decade. A little over 3,000 years ago, master navigators began a series of voyages beginning in the islands to the north of New Guinea. They would eventually sail south and east, crossing the nearly 400 kilometer sea gap between Makira and Nendo in what is today the Southeast Solomon Islands, becoming the first human settlers of what we would today call remote Oceania. The traces of these early settlements included distinctive dentate stamped pottery. Archaeologists call this pottery lapita, and most agree that it is part of a larger cultural complex that bears the same name. Eventually, lapita navigators would locate and settle across an area that includes the present-day islands of Vanuatu, as well as New Caledonia, Fiji, Tonga, and Samoa. The sailing canoes that carried Vanuatu's initial lapita settlers also carried the crops and domesticated animals that would be essential to setting up new island societies. There is some evidence that initially people were able to subsist off of an abundant and predator-naive terrestrial fauna, resulting in the extinction of several species, including a land crocodile and horned tortoise, discovered by my colleagues at the Lapita Cemetery of Teoma on a Fate Island. Eventually, however, people cleared land and established gardens and the rotating agricultural systems that continue to persist in the present. The pollen record from Vanuatu shows clear evidence for burning and reduction of rainforest tree species over time and an intensification of these processes within the last 1,000 years. Yet the native forest was never completely eliminated in much of Vanuatu as it has been on other Pacific islands. Rather, the rotating system allows forest cover to return in fallow plots. Pockets of forest are also retained in high slopes and steep valleys as a source of building materials and wild foods. When people arrived in the five islands of southern Vanuatu, which are the ones where I've been doing archaeological fieldwork since 2011, they found a variety of island environments. One can imagine people were initially drawn by the active volcano of Tana Island, Mount Yasur. Yasur sends up a regular fireworks display, launching ash and tephra bombs hundreds of meters into the air, and could be seen as well as heard from far away indeed, particularly at night. The constant eruptions of Yasur provide an incredibly rich soil for growing crops on Tana, though it can also pose a risk all too well understood by the people who live in nearby villages. Tana is surrounded by four neighboring islands. Aramongo is the largest of the group at over 850 square kilometers. It too is a volcanic high island, though no longer active, its volcanoes having gone dormant long before the first people arrived in the region. Anaitium is another high island featuring even more ancient soils. Because of the tectonic activity in the area, a coral spit to the east of Tana has been uplifting to form the tiny island of Aniwa, less than 10 square kilometers in area and the high point just over 40 meters above sea level. Futuna was formed under similar circumstances, an undersea volcanic cone covered in coral reefs that has now grown to a similarly tiny island, but with extremely steep slopes reaching over 650 meters above the sea. When people first arrived in southern Vanuatu, the larger islands would have been immediately appealing given their agricultural potential. However, Aniwa and Futuna would have represented great opportunities to collect marine resources and seabirds, and a more marine resource-oriented subsistence on these islands remains a pattern today. A thousand years passed after initial settlement. By about 2,000 years ago, populations would have expanded into the mountainous interiors of the larger islands. During this time, people first developed new potting traditions, such as a distinctive fingernail impressed pattern my colleague Stuart Bedford has documented in southern Aramongo and northern Tana. Eventually, people abandoned pottery production altogether. Cooking pots were replaced with the ubiquitous oceanic technology of the earth oven, which used a lined bed of hot stones to cook vegetables, meat, and laplap, which are puddings made of grated starchy root crops, leaf vegetables, meat or fish, and occasionally treats such as coconut or pawpaw. Roughly 1,000 years ago, a few key events happened that are difficult to disentangle into any simple causal explanation. 
human populations continued to grow in the region, resulting in an expansion and intensification of cropping practices. On an Aitium, clearing in the uplands resulted in erosion, but people took advantage of the newly formed alluvial deposits by investing in terraced, irrigated pond field systems designed to maximize the productivity of taro. The people of Futuna likewise built extensive terraced crop systems across the steep slopes of their island. Around this time, we also know there was an incursion of newcomers from over the seas to the east. The next wave of oceanic navigators spoke distinctive languages from the Polynesian family tree. Today, the remnants of this linguistic adoption exist in the Futuna Aniwa Polynesian language, which is more closely related to Hawaiian or New Zealand Maori, languages from thousands of kilometers away than it is to those of the neighboring intervisible islands in southern Vanuatu. In addition to a new language, people brought new aspects of food and drink with them. Oral traditions and linguistic evidence suggest that kava, despite being originally domesticated in central or northern Vanuatu, was a Polynesian introduction in southern Vanuatu. Kava produces an intoxicating beverage made by straining water through the chewed root of the plant through a husk of palm bark. Drinking it produces a heady buzz followed by a deep sleep. Traditionally, it was exclusively a beverage for the chiefly classes. There is also some evidence that pigs may have been introduced or reintroduced to the region by the Polynesian sailors. Within this context of cross-cultural interaction, agricultural intensification, and changing everyday practices, my colleagues and I have argued that what constitutes custom in southern Vanuatu today began to emerge. The agricultural systems and marine resource management practices not only produce enough for subsistence, but abundance and surplus. Again, Western discourse has suggested that it is this production of surplus that self-aggrandizers exploit to gain power and prestige, resulting in runaway processes of centralization that eventually allow for the emergence of kings and states. Matthew Spriggs has suggested that this somewhat explains the emergence of a class of hereditary paramount chief called Natimarid on a Naitium. On Aramango, there was a chiefly class of Fanlo, male chiefs, and Nasim Nalan, female chiefs. However, their titles were contested. Chiefs were expected to periodically host feasts for their neighbors, the most dramatic example being the Nevsim, which centered on a tower that could be dozens of meters high and would hold hundreds of pigs, bundles of yams, and kava. In addition to a sham fight that occasionally became a real fight, dancing, and speeches, it was expected that the chief distribute this abundance at the end of the ceremonies. The chiefs who could give away the most were able to secure the strongest alliances and maintain the highest titles. This mass gifting economy, or fighting with food, as Spriggs has called it, represents one of the mechanisms through which Melanesians avoided the emergence of hierarchy as there was no long-term accumulation of wealth that could be hoarded by one individual or passed on between generations. Folklore also reflects on ways that self-aggrandizers were managed, as versions of a story from Fatuna, Aniwa, and Tana tell how the culture hero Mwatiktiki saved the people of these islands by defeating a ravenous man-eating monster who is arguably presented as an allegory of those who would seek too much power. Tana represents an extreme example of horizontal organization. There are no paramount chiefs on Tana, though chiefly titles abound. One survey in the 1950s conducted by the French anthropologist Jean Guillard documented roughly one chief for every 11 people. Where neighboring islands had six or seven land divisions, Tana has roughly 120, and the number fluctuates because the boundaries are still under dispute in some of these territories. In addition to territorial distinction, Tana features a moiety system that divides people between numrukwen, wise and subtle magicians, and kaviametta, strong and aggressive warriors. The overlay of men's kava drinking grounds, agricultural plots, family hamlets, chiefship, and the moiety system results in an extraordinarily complex but very horizontally organized social system.
the smaller islands of Futuna and Aniwa follow the way of the Tanese. The introduction of a new language did not correspond with introduction of the more hierarchical chiefly systems to be found to the east in Polynesia. Rather, through close ties of exchange and kinship, particularly between Tana and Aniwa, a new language was spread but adapted to an extant way of organizing society horizontally. I would never suggest that Vanuatu be held up as a model for those organizing for a better world in Western societies. Nor is the intent here to suggest that Vanuatu was a harmonious, peaceful, idyllic place. These societies were characterized by conflict and indeed warfare, which became more deadly with the introduction of firearms in the 1800s. This kind of conflict nonetheless also helped to maintain horizontality in these unique Melanesian civilizations. Regardless, the archeological perspective of seeing a society's entire trajectory from the deep past to the present provides real material to challenge those who would tell us that hierarchy and the state are natural, inevitable, or preferable forms of human social organization. To close, I would like to acknowledge that while these are my own ideas, I owe a very real debt of gratitude to colleagues in Vanuatu, including Matthew Spriggs, Stuart Bedford, Frederic Valentin, and the Ni Vanuatu archaeologists Edson Willey, Richard Shing, and Yarawai Philp. I owe a further thanks to the traditional knowledge keepers, field workers, and chiefs in the islands where I work, including Samson Yeru, Joel Yao, Taronga Kuautonga, Denise Elena, the late Jacob Kapere, and the late Jerry Taki. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. To help others find Anarchist Essays, please rate and review us wherever you find your podcasts. And if you're interested in anarchist ideas, why not check out the journal Anarchist Studies? For over 20 years, Anarchist Studies has been publishing original research on the history, theory, and practice of anarchism. For more information, visit www.lwbooks.co.uk forward slash anarchist studies.